but uh, wanted to go ahead and, and uh, not take Mark's place here, but uh, certainly get us started until uh, he's able to, to join us with audio. Um, but just so that everyone knows, we'll be taking questions. If you look at your screen, you'll notice on the toolbar, there's a Q&A feature. If you utilize that during their, um, the, our speaker's presentations, we'll be taking the questions and answers at the end. So please feel free to go ahead and, and utilize that at any given time. Um, we'll answer all the questions as we as we get to them at the end, um, in the order that they were received, and um, and it says here in my notes that I, that Mark would turn it over to me now for some chamber announcements. So um, here I am. Um, wanted to let everyone know that that you know we are very excited to announce that that the season seems to be continuing well into summer, and uh, I know that our businesses and our hotels have been feeling that. Uh, but here locally at the visitor center, um, we've seen numbers that that rival 2019's numbers, and that's keeping in mind that, that people are bringing in smaller parties when they come. Um, so we're still seeing even deep into May, because so we're in the middle of May right now, um, as as high a number as 225 on the weekends, um, and and the numbers aren't dipping out of the triple digits just yet. So we're um, this late after Easter and, and into May. Being able to see a hundred people through the visitor center every day is an anomaly. It's not something that we that you typically um, continue to see uh, this far past our, our Easter holiday. So we're very excited about that. Also very excited to let you all know that this will be um, not our last Zoom luncheon, but certainly um, excited to announce that we'll be getting back to in-person lunches starting next month, June 17th. We'll be meeting at the Sundial at noon and our speaker will be Dana Young, the uh, CEO and um, president of Visit Florida. And we're very excited about that. We do expect that meeting to sell out. We will be um, sending out some emails later on today and obviously throughout the, the month um, leading up to it. We, we would hope that, that um, we get to see everybody in person. We get to, uh, to, to shake hands and hug and it sounds so, um, gosh, it, it sounds so wild to say something like that and, and a little, um, a little irresponsible, but but I would love to to, um, to see everyone um, in person for that meeting on June seventeenth, the Sundial. Um, this meeting is, as you all know, will be covering a lot of water quality issues, um, and uh, and and certainly want to make sure that we understand that that here at the San Miguel Captiva Chamber, we we have a government affairs committee meeting. And it's not something we take lightly. It is every bit um, our top priority when we look at, um, I'm trying to switch slides. When we look at our legislative priorities for this year, every one of our legislative priorities um, was built around water quality. So our first one was around funding for priority Everglades restoration projects, including the Everglades Ever Agricultural Era Reservoir um, to accomplish the objective of clean water south. Um, and, you know, while we were able to secure the funding, the rest of them, and James will talk on it later, so I won't steal his thunder, the rest of them focus around policy issues, and, and um, James will cover some good, some bad, some not so great stuff um, that came out of this legislative session, but we want you all to know that this is something that going into the rainy season, um, we won't take our, our eyes off of. Oh, looks like Mark is here. Excellent. Um, I'm trying to pull up the slideshow, but uh, at this time, I would like to um, also let you know that Visit Florida was one of, not necessarily a priority, but something that we supported um, with Visit Florida was refunding of Visit Florida at the $50 million level or beyond. And we were successful in that as well. We were able to get um, Visit Florida $75 million in the budget hoping and expecting that the governor will sign off on it within the next 30 days. So we'll hear a lot more about that next month um, at the luncheon with Dana Young at the Sundial. Once again, that will be on the 17th of, of um, June at the Sundial at noon. We do hope to see everyone there. And I'd like to turn it over right now to um, Bailey's, which is our sponsor um, for this luncheon. I know we've got um, Richard and Callie and the worldwide headquarters, um, Bailey's, down here on, on Periwinkle Wave, but they are currently muted. So Callie, if you wouldn't mind uh, stepping up and unmuting, that would be fantastic. 
you should be able to hear us. Our um, conference setup isn't quite working correctly, so we're talking from a different device. Well, we can hear you perfectly. Yes. Okay, great. Wonderful. So good afternoon, everyone. It's uh, a real pleasure and an honor to be able to sponsor this event. Uh, there's nothing more important than water quality, not just to, to Bailey's, but also throughout Southwest Florida. Uh, this is something that uh, as a family, we've made a personal commit to, commitment to many years ago. And as we pull through this and look forward to the future, I have, cannot wait to hear from our uh, James Evans uh, with SCCF, uh, who's been a leader in this, this fight for a long time as well as Chauncey Goss, uh, former city councilman and now the head of the South Florida Water Management District. Um, we, we gratefully support this uh, meeting today and look forward to uh, hearing some good news. And if there's uh, things that we need to be aware of, we'll look forward to hearing that as well too. So thank you very much. Thank you all and uh, thank you for sponsoring this event. Uh, we wouldn't be able to do things like this without our, our members and our sponsors. So we appreciate you very, very much. And at this time, I'd like to turn it over to our board chair, Mark Blust, um, who will be introducing our speakers today. Good afternoon, everyone. Glad you all could make it. As you know, my name is Mark Blust. I'm board chair this year, representing the Prumbroker Restaurant Group, and more specifically, Timbers and Matsaluna Restaurants. Uh, today, we've got two great speakers, as was already been alluded to. Uh, if I may introduce them, uh, James Evans. James will be giving a local update on our present water quality, sharing some concerns and opportunities that we have going into the rainy season and providing an update on our legislative priorities. Chauncey will then provide an update on South Florida Water Management District and the status of the Lake Okeechobee System Operating Manual. James is a proud military veteran, having served more than eight years in the U.S. Army and the Ohio and Florida National Guard. He has more than 23 years of experience working in South Florida ecosystems and expertise in water quality, environmental policy, marine biology, estuarine ecology, coastal systems, environmental restoration, land management, and grant management. He holds a BS in environmental studies and an MS in environmental science from Florida Gulf Coast University. James is responsible for interpreting science to create, inform, and advance environmental policy in Southwest Florida. SCCF's environmental policy priorities include protection and restoration of important habitats, growth and land management issues, fish and wildlife conservation, and restoration of inland and coastal water resources. Chauncey Goss is the founder and managing partner of Goss Practical Solutions, a firm that provides federal fiscal policy analysis and budget forecasting. Prior to starting with the firm, Goss served as deputy state director and director of budget review for the House Budget Committee under Paul Ryan. As a longtime resident of Southwest Florida, Goss first became involved with water quality issues when he worked as executive director of the Gasparilla Island Conservation and Improvement Association on Boca Grande in the early 1990s. Porter Goss grew up on Sanibel Island and is active in his community. He has served as an elected member of the Sanibel City Council. He is past chair of the Board of Trustees at the Canterbury School in Fort Myers. He serves on the boards of Captains for Clean Water, the Sanibel Captiva Conservation Foundation, and is the current chair of South Florida Water Management District. We are so lucky to have these two guys in our backyard. You can't even begin to believe it. So with that, I'll turn it over for James for the first portion of the presentation today. Thanks, Mark. Can you all hear me? Okay, yes. Can... Let me go ahead and share my screen real quick. I've got a few picture slides I want to go through, if that's OK. All right, hopefully you can see my screen. Uh, good afternoon. It's, it's certainly a pleasure to be here today uh, with, with Chairman Goss. Uh, we've been on a couple of uh, panels and, and presentations here lately uh, talking about water issues. So again, it's a, it's a great pleasure to be with, with Chauncey today. And I also want to um, certainly thank uh, Bailey's for sponsoring today's discussion. Um, I think it's going to be a really important discussion given where we are uh, currently with lake levels and the water quality conditions. 
And I'm going to go ahead and just kind of start off with, with the good news. Um, and as, as you all drive across the causeway uh, and you look out on, on San Carlos Bay and out into the Gulf of Mexico, um, you can see the beautiful conditions we're currently experiencing. And, and we've experienced those conditions most of the, most of the dry season uh, because the flows that we've been getting to the Clusahatchee have actually been in the optimal flow range and that's been great. Um, these are, this is a photo that was taken from the drone that uh, the SCCF just recently purchased through a grant through the um, CHNEP, the Coastal and Heartland um, Estuary uh, Program. And, um, you know, fortunately, this drone is, is giving us some new tools that we can use to, to report on water quality. Of course, uh, a picture is worth a thousand words, and, and we're making sure our policymakers and our water managers see these pictures on a, on a regular basis uh, for, for good or bad. Um, when our conditions are great, we want to you know, shout from the rooftops. But when our water quality is bad, uh, we want to make sure that we are getting the policies uh, and protections that we need to uh, not only protect our ecology within the estuary, but also to protect our local economy because our economy depends on our water quality. And so um, I just want to give you a quick update on the conditions uh, in the water management system. Of course, you all know that our water management system uh, reaches all the way from just south of Orlando, uh, starting at Shingle Creek, down through the Cassini watershed, into the uh, Lake Okeechobee, east to the St. Lucie, and west to the Caloosahatchee. And of course, historically, that water used to go south, and that's where we want it to go after we get some of these important restoration projects done. But current conditions, uh, right now the lake sits at about 13.68 feet. Uh, and when you compare that to last year, we're about 2.51 feet higher than last year. Uh, if you look in the lower left hand side here, you can see my cursor. Um, you can see this little table that I put together here. In 2019, uh, lake levels were about 11.28 feet. So that's, uh, we're about 2.39 feet higher today than we were in, in 2019. And we will look at 2018. Of course, many of you probably remember what happened in 2018. Um, that was the year we received very high discharges from Lake Okeechobee. Um, along with those discharges, we had some blue-green algae blooms that blanketed the Clusahatchee River. And we were also impacted by a pretty extensive red tide bloom uh, that impacted uh, the local economy as well as uh, the, the ecological resources of our coastal waters. Uh, and at that time, um, water levels were about 0.64 feet lower than they are today. So we're actually, you know, lake levels are higher today than they were in 2018. And with the lake levels being high, it means the Army Corps of Engineers needs to do what's called regulatory releases to get the water out of the lake. Right now, the Corps is taking a conservative approach uh, and they're only releasing 2,000 cubic feet per second to the Caloosahatchee, while they're not releasing any water to the East Coast, to the St. Lucie. Unfortunately, that's keeping water levels up uh, as we enter the rainy season, which typically, you know, for the inland communities starts in, in June and for us here in Sanibel uh, can start as, as late as early July. So um, we hope that the Army Corps of Engineers can start to get lake levels down prior to the rainy season, but based on lake levels, it's not looking that hopeful. And right now, the target flows to the Clusatch here about 2,000 cubic feet per second. And again, that puts us in our optimal flow range for the salinities throughout the estuary. So again, conditions are really good. Um, we're getting about 50% of the total flow that's going out of the lake. Um, currently about 550 cubic feet per second is coming into the lake from all sources and about 4,500 is going out, um, of which 50% is going to the Caloosahatchee, about 47% of that's going south, and only 3% of that is going to the east of St. Lucie. And so as I talk about some of the water quality issues, I just want to remind everybody um, the, the, the two types of algae that we're, that, we're, that we're most likely to deal with when we see these releases from the lake uh, or we see harmful algal blooms in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, the first one is a freshwater species called Microcystis uh, aeruginosa, which is a, a blue-green algae or cyanobacteria. And that's very common in Lake Okeechobee. Uh, and in, in the freshwater uh, systems when we have high nutrients such as nitrogen and phosphorus uh, in the system and warm water temperatures. So when we have higher water temperatures, we tend to see more blue-green algae. And the other one is the Florida red tide organism, which is Karenia brevis, and that's a, a marine dinoflagellate, which that has the ability to produce a neurotoxin that's, that can kill 
fish and wildlife uh, and it's harmful, uh, can, can create a respiratory irritant for humans. And of course, um, as, as a tourism-based economy, we all know too well the impacts that red tide has on our coastal communities. Um, but I also want to mention um, the blue-green algae, the cyanobacteria, also have the ability to produce toxins. And uh, microcystis has the ability to produce a toxin called microcystin. Um, and at certain levels, um, it can be harmful uh, to, to humans uh, and cause liver damage, uh, can kill um, domestic pets and, um, and other animals or wildlife. So, you know, both of these different species of algae are harmful to, uh, again, not only to wildlife, but also to our local economies here. Another, another uh, algae type that I wanna just bring up because we're starting to see this pop up and this is kind of the time of year we tend to see it in our coastal waters out in the Gulf of Mexico is called trichodesmium. It's a marine cyanobacteria. Uh, it has the ability to fix nitrogen so it doesn't depend on the nitrogen in the water. Um, so it actually has a competitive advantage when, we're, when our nutrient levels in the Gulf of Mexico are actually low. And this is a really important species for producing um, you know, uh, primary productivity in the Gulf of Mexico. So this is one of those species that are actually very important to our, to the world's oceans. Um, but it, you know, it can produce toxins, although um, this particular species that we see around here isn't known to produce toxins. Um, but of course, we always recommend if you see these blooms, avoid them. Um, you shouldn't be swimming in an area where there's dead fish or harmful algal blooms. Um, the bloom uh, here on the left-hand side was reported by the Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission this past week out in the Gulf of Mexico. It looks like uh, sea sawdust. That's why its common name is sea sawdust. And it's been around for, for you know, centuries. Uh, and the picture on the right-hand side of your screen shows a bloom that's occurring on Sanibel and uh, the Isabel Canal at the dead end of the canal that was uh, reported on the 11th yesterday uh, by the city's natural resource department. I also want to note that trichodesmia is one of those um, organisms that can actually provide nutrients that can feed red tides. So um, because this organism can fix nitrogen from the atmosphere um, when, it, when it has enough iron, uh, it can actually produce nutrients that can actually feed um, or um, accelerate or, or uh, provide the nutrients needed for red tide. So that's an important connection. So our current red tide status, this is a map from uh, the end of April to uh, May 6th. So it's not current conditions. I have some more current conditions I can show you. Uh, here in a second, but you'll notice that most of the red tide uh, is, is occurring between Tampa Bay um, south to about Collier County. Uh, and you can see some of the higher concentrations uh, in Charlotte Harbor near the Peace River uh, at medium concentrations uh, and, and higher concentrations, and then down by Fort Myers Beach with medium concentrations and down near Bonita Beach and Naples uh, beaches uh, in the high concentrations. Here's a map uh, that was taken from today. Again, it's not showing any current, um, you know, current reports other than from May 5th, but you can see that we've had high concentrations over the last week uh, along, you know, Bonita Beach and Naples. And we've also had some medium concentrations along Fort Myers Beach. And last week, Fort Myers Beach did report some uh, small fish kills. They picked up about 100 dead fish mostly uh, catfish, mullet, uh, and some puffers, um, but, but we are seeing some of the impacts of, of this red tide bloom. <clears throat> this is a, a map that is put together by the Gulf of Mexico Coastal, Observing, uh, Coastal Ocean Observing System. And it's uh, a network of people that are going out there and collecting data. Our marine lab participates in this um, through what's called the uh, Habscope Project. And, they go out there, they collect cell counts, and then through the cell counts and, and the meteorological conditions, they can make forecasts of where the red tide might impact the communities. This is a really important tool for tourism because it, it gives us a, a warning or an indicator of where red tide might impact our coastal communities. And you can see here, the only site on Sanibel um, that is in the um, low conditions uh, is Tarpon Bay. All the other ones are in the very low conditions as far as uh, projected impacts from red tide. Um, so that's a good sign. That's data that was collected um, as of today. Uh, Lover's Key State Park is in the moderate range. Uh, and again, this is data collected from today. Uh, and this is mostly uh, really dependent, of, uh, dependent on the concentrations of red tide and the wind direction. So the wind directions are, are primarily gonna be out of the west, southwest. So with red tide along the beaches of Fort Myers and Bonita, we can expect 
that those impacts would be to those communities along the coast. And here in Bonita Beach, you can see the higher concentrations of red tide with a higher risk to those coastal communities because of higher cell counts as well as the wind direction. So now I'm going to shift gears a little bit and talk about the current status of the blue-green algae blooms in Lake Okeechobee and in the coastal estuaries. As of yesterday, the, um, the NOAA National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration is reporting about 500 square miles um, of area of Lake Okeechobee, which is a 730 square mile lake, uh, being impacted by cyanobacteria blooms. Um, these colors indicate the intensity of the blooms with the red colors more intense and the, and the lighter colors, uh, blue colors, uh, less intense blooms. Um, but you can see that, again, about 500 square miles of the lake is currently being impacted by blue-green algae within the lake. And of course, right now we're receiving some regulatory discharges from the lake at a level of about 2,000 cubic feet per second to the Kusachi. Uh, and we are starting to see some of those blue-green algae blooms uh, starting to move into the Caloosahatchee through the Moorhaven Lock. And the photo on the left-hand side was taken two days ago. Those photos were taken by the, uh, the Calusa Waterkeeper. Uh, I wanna thank John Cassani for providing those photos and their pilot that are flying um, almost daily. And you can see the blue-green algae bloom uh, just downstream of the, uh, the Moorhaven Lock here. Uh, this green patch here is, is blue-green algae. And we're having a similar situation in the St. Lucie Estuary. Uh, this is the S308. Uh, lock structure, and that was taken on the 11th, uh, which was yesterday. This is an aerial photo taken of Lake Okeechobee two days ago from the Clusa Waterkeeper. You can see the extensive uh, streaking and, and blue-green algae blooms on the lake. Again, this is the same shot from Moorhaven, just a little larger, so you can see the blue-green algae uh, downstream to the east of the Moorhaven Lock, sorry, to the, uh, to the west of the Moorhaven Lock. This is a, a photo that was taken um, near LaBelle in the Caloosahatchee. You can see the blue-green algae bloom uh, starting to move down the river, um, almost uh, crossing the entire river here, but concentrated uh, along the shoreline. Again, just another photo uh, downstream of, of LaBelle. And so, you know, current conditions, you know, are not looking good with lake levels where they are, almost two and a half uh, feet higher than they were over the last two years and higher than they were in 2018. And I just wanted to show you this image from 2018. This was a slideshow I did a couple of years ago. And we really didn't see these blooms in Lake Okeechobee picking up to the point they are today until you know, June and July, uh, where they hit their peak uh, algal abundance. You can see here that you know, about 90% of the lake at this time in June, June 24th, was covered with blue-green algae. And at that time, we were seeing discharges into the Caloosahatchee, uh, which covered more than 70 miles of the Caloosahatchee. Um, and of course, the St. Lucie was also being you know, devastated by the releases and the guacamole-like you know, algae that was flowing into the St. Lucie at the time. So you know, as we look forward to the rainy season, I think it's going to be critical that we as a community and, and as a business community continue to put pressure on the Army Corps of Engineers, um, our, 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 our regional um, you know, uh, representatives, uh, state and federal representatives. Uh, we've had a number of our, uh, you know, at least uh, Congressman Donald's team uh, is really starting to step up and, and, and working with the Army Corps of Engineers to, um, to try and weigh in on the Lake Okeechobee System Operating Manual, which is, is going to be the new lake regulation schedule. Um, so anyway, we're moving in the right direction, but we need our state representatives really fighting for us on this issue um, because we can't do it alone. And of course, the business community is probably the most powerful tool we have uh, to make the case for uh, what we need to protect, to protect our communities here. So I'm just going to end with a couple slides showing um, you know, some of the outcome of the 2021 legislative session, and I'm just going to touch on some of the highs and lows. I'll start off with some of the highs. Um, the, you know, the environmental budget was good for the environment. Uh, we got about 522 million for Everglades restoration projects, and that includes uh, full funding for the C43 reservoir, funding for the EA reservoir, and other uh, important projects for the um, for the Everglades. Of course, at the federal level, we're going to be continuing to 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 beat the drum to get the 725 million that we need for federal funding so that we, over the next four years, so that we can keep 
all of these projects on track with the integrated delivery schedule, which is the plan the Army Corps uses to fund these important Everglades projects. But the state is doing their part, so that's a good thing. We also received 400 million for the Florida Forever Land Acquisition Program, 300 million of which came from federal stimulus dollars. So that, that's, that's very important. Um, 500 million for the newly created Resiliency Grant Trust Fund Program to address flooding and sea level rise uh, associated with climate change. We also received 500 million for water protection and sustainability, um, the, pro the program uh, which provides grants for septic to sewer and wastewater projects, um, infrastructure, and then 100 million in funding for the Piney Point disaster, um, which of course, as you all know, um, the Piney Point discharges came as a result of, of holding ponds that were be, being used um, as part of the phosphate industry's um, way to hold, uh, hold water in the gypsum stacks. Of course, there was a leak, water discharged into Tampa Bay, very high nutrient loads uh, went into Tampa Bay. Um, and had a, it is having an impact on Tampa Bay. So um, that's an issue that, um, that needs attention. And fortunately, there'll be some funding that will help address those issues. <clears throat> as far as legislation, SB 100 passed. Um, that was a, an, important, uh, an important bill that was a partial uh, MCORS repeal. It's the multi corridors of regional economic um, uh, concern um, where they were, the, the legislature was proposing to do an extensive um, toll, pro, toll road project throughout the state, which would have had direct impacts on the Clusatchee watershed. So we're very happy to see there was a partial repeal uh, and most of those harmful toll roads were eliminated. Um, but there is one section that will be um, near I-10 uh, in the Tampa area uh, that is still moving forward. And it's unfortunate that that's moving forward, but that will be moving forward and there will be some ecological impacts as a result of that. But we hope the governor does sign this bill. Um, we think that at least protects the majority of the areas that would have been impacted by that, by that proposal. Um, we also uh, received uh, legislative funding of 750,000 for the Sanibel Phase uh, 4 sewer expansion project. So thank you to the city of Sanibel and everybody at the city of Sanibel for um, working to get that legislative funding and thank the legislature for that funding. Uh, that will allow us to move forward with the final phase of sewer on Sanibel. Uh, SB 776 passed, and that's the racketeering of aquatic and wildlife animal life. Of course, here on Sanibel, we were directly impacted by um, people that were, uh, that were removing uh, wildlife from our islands, uh, particularly uh, freshwater turtles, and they were being um, sold to Asian markets. Um, and we're glad to see there'll be some additional tools to uh, prosecute those uh, folks that are violating uh, wildlife rules. And then finally, as far as positive legislation, um, we received 50 million uh, for water storage north of Lake Okeechobee uh, to help fund aquifer storage and recovery wells. Uh, it's important to note that uh, SECF took a neutral um, position on this bill. It's primarily a, an agricultural water supply project, but it is part of the Comprehensive Everglades Restoration Plan, and it does provide an important water supply component for SERP. Um, so we are glad to see that that, um, that was funded. It could take some pressure off of some of the other environmental restoration projects. Um, so we hope that all those projects continue to move forward. And then finally, I'll just, um, I'll just end with a couple of lows. Uh, I should have ended with the highs, but I'll end with some of the lows. Um, there are a number of bills um, that uh, work to preempt local governments from implementing measures to protect water quality. Uh, and protect um, and implement land use um, measures that would protect and shape their local communities. Uh, one of which was SB uh, Senate Bill 268, uh, preemption of local occupational licensing, uh, which could have an impact on local uh, government's ability to implement things like fertilizer ordinances and other protections. Uh, HB 1101 uh, also passed, which uh, provides relief from the burdens of real property rights, uh, extension of the Burt Harris property rights um, but was an unnecessary um, uh, preemption of local government's ability to regulate, um, you know, at the local level. Uh, and then finally, uh, the other harmful preemption bill was the state preemption of energy infrastructure and regulation. And uh, what that does is limits uh, where local governments can site gas stations and things like that. It was much more harmful. Uh, fortunately, that bill was watered down, um, and we can probably live with it at this point. But again, another attack on local government preemption, um, and we're—it's just—it's a shame to see all of these preemption bills um, 
you know, coming forward. Um, I think local governments know how to regulate their, um, their, their communities the best, um, and we should allow them to uh, do that. Unfortunately, Tallahassee thinks differently. Um, one of the bills that did not pass, it really died on the vine, um, was Senate Bill 1522, and that was to implement the recommendations of the Blue Green Algae Task Force. That was the task force that was put together by Governor DeSantis as part of his executive order 19-12. And the goal of that was to make recommendations on how we can improve water quality and reduce the impact of harmful algal blooms like cyanobacteria blooms like we're seeing today in Lake Okeechobee. Fortunately, that didn't move forward. There were a number of good recommendations in there about septic to sewer, as well as um, you know, regulating nutrient pollution at the source and also implementing best management practices. But uh, it really didn't see light of day. Uh, we hope that comes back next year, um, especially with the impacts we're seeing this year with, with cyanobacteria. On uh, the last two, um, Senate Bill 722, Everglades Protection Area, um, that would have pro prohibited oil and gas wells within the Everglades Protection Area. Fortunately, that did not pass either. Um, and we, we, we hope at some point we can, uh, we can adopt a rule that will prohibit gas exploration and oil exploration in the Everglades uh, park areas. And then finally, uh, one of the bills that um, was, was a very uh, contested and hot issue this year was Senate Bill 88, uh, which was the, the right to farm bill um, or farming operations bill. And that really limits the liabilities from lawsuits for polluters, um, agricultural polluters in particular. Um, and I'll, sing at, uh, I'll single out uh, U.S. Sugar and some of the other um, sugar farmers in the EAA, um, because this one focuses on uh, limiting the liability as it relates to particle emissions. Uh, when sugarcane is burned, of course, it has an impact on the adjacent communities. Um, and many of the environmental communities thought that this was, this was a way to just limit the liability for uh, many of the sugar farmers in the EAA. So um, I think this is one that uh, it's unfortunate that it moved forward. Um, but uh, anyway, it did. So we'll work uh, to, to, to come up with some new legislation next year. Uh, but we want to thank the uh, Chamber and the Chamber Alliance for adopting priorities that focus on water quality. It means a lot to, uh, to us uh, at SCCF and the community of Sanibel. And uh, we look forward to supporting you uh, for next legislative session. And thanks for the opportunity to talk about some of these issues. Thank you, James. Great information. Um, will we have the opportunity to get a copy of this presentation somehow? Absolutely. I'll send it to John while Chauncey's talking. That'd be great. So with that, um, for those in the audience, if you have any questions, uh, you can use the chat button or the Q&A. And after Chauncey speaks, we'll go back through and filter through some of those for you. And so I'll go ahead and let Chauncey take over from here. Mr. Goss. Hey, thanks very much, Mark. I'm going to try and figure out how to share a screen here, which I've never done. So bear with me. Look at that. I think I'm already in that meeting. Um, come on. There we go. Um, I'd like to uh, echo what James said and, and thank uh, the chamber very much for hosting this. And not only that, but for for being so responsible and taking such a leadership role in this issue. Um, it's, it's amazing that we're having this conversation with the chamber. I don't think this would have happened 10 or 15 years ago. And I think this is, I, I love to see it. And I, I can't thank Bailey's enough and Richard for his leadership and Callie for all you're doing, because it really does help. And it, it helps it's heard across the state. And when, when I, when I'm out in different places in the state, people are, are very aware of that Sanibel is, is a leader in this role. And I want to thank the city as well, um, Judy and, and Holly and all the council members um, for just doing a great job of keeping this issue, keep banging the drum because it's, it's something that's not going to go away and it's not going to fix itself. So I'll talk a little bit about what the, um, what I'm dealing with with the water management district. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit first of all, sort of about what the water management district does. And then we'll, we'll get, I'll show you some of the projects we're working on. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit more about management. I, I don't have a ton of information on Lowsome. I know that was what my talk was billed as, but it, it's it's really a core process right now, but I will tell you sort of where they are and what what I think we're, we're gonna expect to see um, um, at the end of my remarks. But one of the things you've got to remember about the water management district is we have, um, we've got some, 
it's sometimes um, conflicting um, goals and, and because we're supposed to take care of flood control, which we're really good at. And that's basically why we were founded. We're supposed to take care of water supply, which we do. And we're, we're very good at that as well. Um, Everglades restoration is something that started uh, recently as a cat jumps on my head. Um, Everglades restoration, restoration is something that started and that's something uh, we're working on. I'm going to show you some of the things we're doing because that's really important to Sanibel because getting these projects up and running is, is critical to us to be able to reduce some of the discharges that we're seeing. The harmful discharges you have to stop. And the best way to stop them is to make sure we've got some of the projects that we're building. And those projects are, they're, I'll show you in a second, they're, they're coming along pretty well. This governor has been fantastic. This legislature has been great. Um, they're, they're helping us fund and, and the Corps of Engineers has been good. The Trump administration was good. And as, um, as James mentioned, we have a $725 million ask into the Biden administration from the state of Florida. And that's something that's going to be very helpful. If the Corps, if the Corps budgeted for $725 million, that's going to be wonderful. That's really going to help us out, uh, particularly with the EAA reservoir which is something that a lot of people on this island became very invested in um, maybe three or four years ago, maybe five years ago. When Senate Bill 10, as you recall, that was, um, that was sort of up and running. That was um, Senate President Joe Negron was pushing that really hard and um, showed huge leadership there. That was something the Sanibel community supported. And that basically made sure that we were having to see uh, the um, huge reservoir south of the lake. Um, and, and that's something that we're working on. The Corps is going to be building that reservoir, and we're building the stormwater treatment area. We, being the South Florida Water Management District, are building the stormwater treatment area. And uh, I'll show you, we're making really good progress on that. And we're about a year ahead of schedule. So that's that's something I'm proud of. And it's it's not me that's doing that. That's a fantastic staff um, following the lead of a governor who's just uh, pushing really hard, which is which is helpful to us. So this, this slide, you, you've probably seen before, and I think James has got iterations of this, but I just want to make sure that everyone always understands that this is sort of on the left is what, what nature gave us, what God intended when Everglades was constructed. Um, the right slide is sort of where we are now. And you see the arrows going right and left. And those that's really what we're trying to work on is those, those arrows going right and left are, are too big. The arrows going uh, south or down are too small. So we're trying to restore the flow um, and we're trying to do it with lots of structures so that we can end up because we basically took that flow that was on the left and and made it so it's now on the right and we did that through structures and we did that because we had really bad floods uh, in the 20s and 30s um, and then in the 40s the the central and southern florida um, project came up with the federal government and that's when we basically started to drain the everglades and again that's we the federal the federal government the corps of engineers and the south florida water management district and did a really good job um, so good that now we're trying to put the water back in the Everglades and not have it go east and west. And that's that's one of our big goals now is, is to build some projects where we can store water and we can store water at the you know, basically the four corners of the lake, southeast, north and west, and make sure that we um, have water then during the dry season when we want it and have a place to store water during the wet season when we really don't want it. And I'll get into what uh, some of the things that John, um, James was talking about in a second, um, particularly as it comes to lake levels, because they, they are very concerning right now. But before we get there, let me let me go through and sort of tell you how we got where we are today. This the water management district has something called water years, and they run from May to May, and it's basically rainy season to um, rainy season to rainy season. So. It, Last water year was really challenging. Uh, we started out, I don't know if you remember on Sanibel, but the, the city did a great job and I think adopted an ordinance about watering restrictions and, and sort of uh, adopted what the water management district had asked them to do, which is say only water twice a week. And one of the reasons we did that is we had a really, really dry um, March and April last year. And going into May, we were worried uh, because the lake was at 11 feet uh, and the, the water supply folks were screaming at us um, saying, you know, we're, we're going to have a drought and we're not going to have any water and it's going to be the end of the world. Uh, and then, then right around Memorial Day, we just got crushed. And I think most of that rain and you see the 3.67 there is um, the, the darker blue. I, I think that probably came towards in the last couple of days of the month. So it, we had a really incredibly wet May. And then we had sort of a normal June, July, August, September. And then as September came around, the, the Corps had done a really good job of not discharging from the lake. And we had been asking them not to discharge from the lake. They were, they were always have their finger on the trigger because they, they watch every everything come off the coast of Africa, all those big hurricanes and, and depressions and or tropical depressions, I guess, um, and lows coming off of Africa. And that 
that is, um, you know, causes them concern because if the lake's high, then they they do not want to get caught with a lake high and then have um, a lot of rain. So they they did a great job and held out. And it, it wasn't until October that they started making releases. And the reason they ended up making releases was we had a, a couple of uh, tropical storms, and then we had a ton of rain in November. So that left us at the end of the end of the rainy season um, after sort of a normal rainy season. We had just two months that were really high there, and that left the lake pretty high. Then after that, um, you know, the rest of the water year has been, you know, not, you know, we had a deficit in January and, and, and in March, but it, it's been sort of average. But what it has acted to do is it's acted to leave the, the lake, as, as James said, two and a half feet above where it was last year. Um, last year it was at 11.2 feet um, today, and today it's at 13.7 feet. So that, that, that makes us uh, concerned because it, we've got to have a place to put that water. So we, we've been trying to, as James said, we're putting about you know 2000 CFS out of the Caloosahatchee right now. Nothing's going out of the St. Lucie right now. And we're moving water south as much as we can um, into the stormwater treatment areas. But those stormwater treatment areas got so beat up last October, November, and they're, they're living things, they're marshes, um, that we can't, we don't want to kill them because if you kill them, then you're they're no use to you at all because basically what they're supposed to be doing is r removing uh, phosphorus so that we can en end up putting that water down into uh, into the Everglades and into the Everglades National Park. Uh, we can't do that if the water is dirty. So we, you know, we can't do that if the stormwater treatment areas aren't working for us. So we're, we're trying to rehabilitate them a little, little bit during the dry season is generally when we do that. And that's what we've been doing. But so but we're moving water. I will say um, the district staff is very aware of this and they're moving as much water as they can south um, right now through any means they have. Um, uh, let's take a look at some of the stuff that we're doing um, on the four corners of the lake real quick. And so the, the C44 reservoir, um, this is a, this is pretty much done. And this is sort of the, one of the big SERP projects, the Comprehensive Everglades Restoration Plan projects. It's the first one that'll be um, fully completed and operational. And, and as you can see from these dates here, you know, this, this thing, we're, we're looking at filling this, um, this reservoir um, in September. Uh, the stormwater treatment areas are basically the marshes around it um, are complete and they're 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 ready to go and they're beautiful and we've got a lot of uh, birds nesting in there and they're they're, they're you know not only removing phosphorus but they're also a great habitat. So that's over on the other side. The C43, this is the one that really impacts us the most. And this is the one that we should be paying attention to. It's it's working, it's 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 on schedule. Um, this is just this slide is just the inflow pump station. Um, and they, we, we gave them a notice to proceed back in March of 2018, and it's uh, about 67% complete. It's going to be finished in May, uh, next May, a year from today. So, you know, we're, we're looking at that. That's just basically a big pump station. The real interesting part, I think, um, is the next slide, and this is the actual reservoir. And this is something that we, I voted on my first day as a, as a governing board member. It was a, a $529 million project, and that was the first thing we voted on. So it's a, it's a lot of money, um, and this is a, a great project. We gave them the notice to proceed in June, and they're they're chugging along on it. If you have a chance to see this, it's um, on the way out to LaBelle, um, just basically where there's a, a curve in the road, and you'll see a sign for the uh, emergency operations center. That's basically where the uh, the construction site is, um, and it, it runs six miles along um, Route um, 82, I believe, and uh, three miles wide. So this is a big reservoir, and it's gonna it's gonna help us out a lot during the dry season. It's gonna be able to hold some water, so that we can then give that to the Caloosahatchee when it needs it. And during the wet season, it's gonna be able to store some of the water that we don't want coming down um, down the river. We're also working on a um, on a on basically a water um, quality. There, when, when this was designed, there was no water quality component to it. We're working on that, and it, we've we've got. Um, I think in the next month or so, we're going to know sort of what there was. I think we've seen the recommendations. We're going to, the governing board, I don't think has made any decision on those recommendations, but we'll see that soon. So that'll make sure that the water coming out of this reservoir um, is, is clean and it hasn't just been sitting there, you know, turning into blue green algae fest. Um, this is the project I was talking about a minute ago, the EAA reservoir. This is the big one. Um, it, it's, it's the largest of the reservoirs we're going to have. Um, the stormwater treatment area we began construction on uh, a little over a year ago, and I've been out to the site a couple times. It's it's really something else. We've been doing a lot of blasting, uh, building some canals, um, and clearing and grubbing, and getting basically ready for the uh, for the stormwater treatment area. Um, and that construction contract, um, I think we just signed that, and that's looking at like September 2023. 
Um, and, and that's right. We put a uh, completion incentive in there um, to, to try and get the contractor to work a little bit faster. So if they get good weather, I think they'll be able to do that. The reservoir itself is being built by the core and the core. Um, we, we signed an agreement with the core. Gosh, it was either earlier this month or late last month. I can't even remember because the days are starting to blend together here um, as we're, we're moving forward on some, so many of these projects. But the point is we ended up signing the project partnership agreement um, and that was a big deal because the core had been, they cannot proceed without that. So that was something the governor came out for that. Um, he, he signed a letter to the core. I signed the project partnership agreement. The core then the next week signed their version of it. So we're all set to go. The core will be building this reservoir. And that's the reason we're asking the uh, Biden administration for $725 million because that's going to help the core to fund this and, and get it finished. Um, so what we're trying to do is move water south, and that's sort of the ultimate goal, so we don't have to have the water coming out of the Caloosahatchee and the St. Lucie. And we've got three projects here that, um, that that are helping us do that. The one in the bottom right is the easiest to explain, and that's just basically raising a 41. And that's been done. Uh, there are a couple miles left to do, I think, but but what we have raised so far, I can't remember how many miles we've raised, but it's a couple already. Um, we are flowing water south. Unfortunately, when we did that, there's a, a couple areas uh, on the other side of the bridge to the east that were getting a little too wet when we did that and when we started putting that water into the park. So what we're going to be doing is building a seepage wall, which is a wall that's underground, and that's what that, that bottom left picture shows. We decided on the governing board to go ahead and do that to keep those areas dry so that we don't end up having groundwater seep, um, seep out of the park into what's called the Las Palmas area or the eight and a half square mile area. And that's going to be very helpful to us. And that'll be done in the next year or two also. So that's going to help us move more water south under those bridges. And then the uh, 333 North. Um, that's a, a pretty picture of a pump station that we've got there. And that helps us again move, move that water south. Um, James mentioned this one a little bit. These are the ASR wells. This is um, part of the um, the project that we've got north of the lake. And we don't really have the land up there that we need for the storage. Um, so, you know, doing a, a big reservoir, a big above ground reservoir, large stormwater treatment areas are a little more difficult for us. So we're looking at um, ASR wells um, and ASR stands for aquifer storage and recovery where we can take some of that water, uh, put it underground and then pull it back um, when we need it. Um, and it's, it, it has some limitations on it. Um, it there were some, some scientific concern. And so we're, we're doing all the science we need to do it on, make sure we're, we're not gonna mess anything up by going forward with the, with the ASRs. ASR is an old technology, it's not new. Um, what's new in this one is we're planning on clustering um, wells together. Um, I think that there's gonna be Eight, eight different areas and there's gonna be 10 wells at each of those areas. So we're just trying to look and see if we start doing that, what impact is that gonna have on the aquifer? What impact is that gonna have on the environment? Making sure that we're not gonna be doing something that we're gonna be undoing in 20 years or that my kids are gonna be undoing in 20 years because we, we seem to be pretty good at that sometimes. So I, we're, we're, we're taking this one cautiously. The legislature has given us plenty of money, uh, I think $150 million to move forward on it. So we are moving forward on it and, and this will help a little bit. Um, some of the other major restoration projects, um, one, of, one of those projects that we're sort of undoing is on the, on the right of the screen there, that's the Kissimmee River. We had, we had straightened it out pretty well and, and now we're putting the curves back in. Um, that project's pretty close to being done and that's going to help um, it's going to help in that in that area. It's not going to totally improve all the water quality coming out of the Kissimmee into Lake Okeechobee, but it, but it's going to help and, and everything we do to help is great. The middle slide there is a, is a picture of picking and strand and that's a that's an actual SERP project and it's down in Collier County, is you're going over um, Alligator Alley, uh, just after you go through the toll booth, if you sort of look right, that area was going to be a huge development and it had been platted with roads and canals um, and it had really messed up water flow. That's something that the state, um, the state and the federal government and the water management district all came together, uh, have purchased that land and are, we've got a, a huge restoration there. It's, it's very close to being done. Uh, we've got the pump stations. We've got three enormous pump stations there. They're all ready to operate. I think most of the groundwork has been done. There's one area at the very Southern end of that, that we're, we're worried about. Um, we need to build a wall there so that we don't flood out some, uh, 
some groves or um, some agricultural interest down there. And once that done, once that's done, I think a picayune will be up and running. So that's another CERT project that we we expect to see online in the next couple of years. Um, and then down in the Miami area, you've probably I, I actually don't know if you read the papers over there. I do because I have to because of the, my district work. But if, if you've been paying any attention, they, they've been having some water quality issues um, in, in Biscayne Bay. And so th this is this is a really good project that we're working forward um, as well. All right. So that's the end of my slides. I'm going to try. How do I I'm going to stop screen sharing and go back to normal and um, talk a little bit about the um, the LOSM project. Um, that that basically there's the the Corps of Engineers has a, a manual to operate the lake. Right now they're operating on something called Lores, which is the Lake Okeechobee. Um, help me out, James. Um, what's the S for R for? Uh, regulation schedule. Regulation schedule. Thank you. So the Lake Okeechobee regulation schedule, which was written back in 2008, or maybe it was adopted in 2008, which means it was probably written prior to that. So it's, it's pretty old and it didn't take any of these projects I just showed you into consideration. So now the core is trying to take these new projects into consideration through something called LOSM or the Lake Okeechobee system operating manual, which will replace LORS 08. And it, when it, as it replaces it, what it's gonna do is it, it's supposed to take into into account the fact that we're going to have all this new storage. So it's gonna help help the core manage the lake um, better. And when I say better, um, it it's, LORS is interesting and it, it does not have a lot of flexibility in it. It's, it's you know, one, it's a flow chart type operation. And, you know, you start on the left and you, you work your way to the right. And if the answer is yes, you go one way. And if the answer is no, you go the other way. It doesn't really put much of a human in the loop. So you can't sort of go, you know, go, well, you know, yes, but, you know, and, and that's one of the problems and with LORS in my view. And the core has been really good over the last couple of years about pursuing something called operational flexibility in which they're allowed to say, you know, sort of yes, but, and the yes, but would be, yeah, but we've got algae on the lake right now and we don't want to open those gates or yes, but we don't want to give the Caloosahatchee any more water right now because it's, there's, there's red tide blooming there and that's not something we want to do. So it gives them that flexibility to sort of to, to take all, all the variables. I mean, if you think about how many variables they have to look at every day, those flow charts just don't do it. And, and, they, they, and I don't think they ever can. I mean, until we have artificial intelligence that works you know, really well, but we're not there yet. So I, as long as we've got, you know, smart people making smart decisions, we're in great shape. And that's one of the things that from my, my standpoint on the water management district, I want to make sure that the core is always paying attention to what's going on around them. And I think that you know, as Lowsome as Lowsome is being contemplated, that's what we need to look at as well is to make sure that we have the flexibility in Lowsome to say, yes, but we're not going to do that because, and, and that's, that's sort of the, I think you always have to have that out. Um, the water supply community generally does not like flexibility because they like certainty. Um, because you know, if you're growing a crop, you want a certainty. You want to know I got this much water this time of day, no matter what, and I'm, I've got a guarantee that I'm going to have that. And that's great, but I just I, I'm not sure that that works really well in the real world where you just have the variables of weather. And you know, sometimes it rains and sometimes it doesn't. And and we're always going to have that. And we're always going to have extremes, and we can manage for the uh, averages very well. Um, it's the extremes that we're trying to deal with. And that, that's that's really where I think LOSM is going to come into play is to, to make sure that we manage the lake in such a way that all these new projects that we're putting in, all the billions of dollars of money we're spending on these projects isn't for nothing because we're managing the lake in a way that doesn't make sense. So that's that's sort of my my view on, on LOSM. And I, I don't want to get into the nuts and the bolts of it because of, um, A, I'm not qualified and B, I'd probably put you to sleep. But I'll turn it back over to John now and, and love to answer any questions. Actually, I'll let Mark take that. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, we do have a couple of questions. First one, I believe, would be for John. What has the governor's response been to the request by SCCF and other environmental groups for a state of emergency? You mean that was for James? Yes. Okay, thanks, Mark. Um, so unfortunately, we haven't heard uh, anything from the governor's office on, you know, on whether or not he's going to declare a state of emergency. And what we were trying to do by requesting that the governor, you know, take action early on um, was primarily to give him the tools he needs to move more water south instead of the Caloosahatchee 
receiving the lion's share of the harmful discharges from the lake. Uh, as I noted in my re you know, report on the conditions, we're receiving right at about the maximum of, of our optimal flows. Any higher, uh, we'll start to get into our stressful and damaging discharges, whereas we're not moving any water east. And the water that's going south right now is primarily for water supply for the Everglades agricultural area. And the water conservation areas are, are pretty high right now. So they, you know, not a lot of water could be moved south. But what the governor could do uh, is he could uh, work with the water management district to try and figure out how we can actually move more lake water south instead of the priority being focused on moving stormwater out of the Everglades agricultural area. And I think that's, pretty, that's, that's one of our primary asks is, look, we're in a dire situation here. Our coastal communities are gonna be devastated by these releases and any harmful algal blooms that come with them. How can we work to share the adversity between all of the different stakeholders and not just focus it on the Clusahatchee? So I think that, that was the goal of, of what we were trying to get at with that letter and the emergency order. Thank you, James. And the second question for either one of you guys, which comes up every time also, is why does the East Coast not get any release? Shouldn't they get the same as Sanibel? When do they start sending water south? What is the maximum amount that can go south? And what is the ramp up of the release to date? You want me to kick that one off, Chauncey? Yeah, but why don't you? And I'll, I'll jump in. Sure, so um, the way it's set up, so the East Coast can take water, of course. Um, we have targets that have been established for both the Clusatchee and the St. Lucie they're called recover targets. And that's, that's part of a CERP, the Comprehensive Everglades Restoration Plan uh, program that looks at science and measures that of, of whether or not we're, we're achieving our, our goals for the different ecological systems. And for the Clusahatchee, the high flow harm threshold is set at 2,600 cubic feet per second. And that's measured at the Franklin Lock, which is the start of the estuary. For the St. Lucie, the target, um, the harm threshold starts at above 1700 cubic feet per second. So when you look at 1700 cubic feet per second compared to 2600, it's not really that much higher for the Clusachi than it is for the St. Lucie. It's just that the St. Lucie has taken this position that they don't want any water from Lake Okeechobee because most of their flows are achieved through the watershed uh, runoff. But, but during the rainy season, so are the Clusachi. In fact, we almost have double the harmful discharges just from the watershed alone without any lake discharges. So our position is during the rainy season, we don't want any lake water either. It's just that I think the East Coast folks have been much more effective at getting that message across because the Clusatchee does now depend on lake flows during the dry season um, because unfortunately we're now connected to the lake. Um, we weren't historically, but we are today. So that makes our issue a more, little more complicated um, as far as moving water south, um, I'll, I'll let Chauncey answer, you know, the capacity south. Um, but most of the capacity south is taken up by stormwater from the Everglades agricultural area. And we see that as an, uh, as an inequity because the taxpayers of Florida do pay about 50% of the cost of maintenance of the stormwater treatment areas um, that should allow us to move more lake water south. Yeah, I, I think one of the things that that we need to realize with the St. Lucie is that there's a, there's a distance issue there also. It's, they can't handle the same amount of water that we can just because they're so much closer to the lake and it would, it, it would really blow them out. Um, and, and as James mentioned, the, the argument for, for us is nuanced because it's, we need water when we need water, but we don't want water when we don't want water. Their argument is pretty clear. They never want water. And it's just an easy, an easier argument for people to digest. And it's, so it's, it's something I think that, as James said, they've been a little better at articulating their position. Um, having said that, you know, we, I, I want to move as much water south as we can. And I think that's really the goal. And that's, that's the reason we're doing all these CERT projects. Right now, what I have found um, in, in my two years or so on the governing board is that our hands are really tied. Uh, the way the legislature set things up um, you know, this is all written in statutes. We, we really have to, you know, depending on your interpretation, the STAs, we have a tough time sending lake water to them because they're generally used by the EAA. And that's generally what it says in Florida law. And, and, and until someone changes that, there's not a whole lot we can do as a water management district. Um, you know, the same thing is true during the rainy season. Um, the federal government says the EAA, you know, shall be afforded this much flood control. 
So until somebody changes that at the federal level, it's going to be drier than people around it because the legislature said that's what is going to happen. So again, I find it a little frustrating at times because I, I like you all think, well, why don't you just do this? And believe me, we would if we could, but there will be, we'll be sued. And maybe at, at times being sued is, is the course you want to take. Maybe it isn't. I don't know. But I, I think that James is, James's point earlier about having an emergency order from the governor does, does help, um, you know, put a finer point on, okay, if, if we're going to do this, this is why we're doing it. It's because this is an emergency and this isn't, you know, a daily operational thing. This is, this is only going to be done now because it's an emergency and, and we'll go back to normal when the emergency goes away. And, and those are things I think that we need to look at, but, you know, ultimately the goal is to be able to move more water South, having the EAA reservoir down there is going to help. Um, even, just even having the STA that we're building, um, you know, that'll be up next year, year or two. And that we're going to be able to move more water into that. And, and that, that can be lake water. So that, that's helpful. And we're also looking at trying to figure out how to get some lake water over to some uh, areas a little bit further west um, to the SDAs five and six, which we, we don't really have a good way of doing right now. All right, great, Gen gentlemen, thank you. That actually cleaned out the Q&A box, so pretty good. So you guys covered a lot of great ground for us today. It's great to see the pictures. Um, Chauncey, the massive projects. I think a lot of people have a hard time trying to scale that. Just, just know how massive these projects are to get done. So it's great seeing the visuals on that. And I know for you and James both and all of us, we're holding our collective breath in regards to blue-green algae and making sure that it is very well under control this, this season. Lord knows everything we've come off of. We don't need that um, heading down the river like we did in 20, 2018. So with that, I'll thank both of you gentlemen again very much for your time and your, your uh, information, your expertise. Continue working. Let us know how we as a business community can continue helping you to uh, get these things projects done. And um, we'll move on. I also like to thank everyone who attended today. This uh, recording will be available um, shortly through the chamber. And thank our sponsor today, Bailey's um, Grocery. And a congrats shout out to them with their, uh, their recent uh solar conversion to help making uh, their business in Sanibel and uh, their footprint on our environment being much more in a positive light. So thank you for that as well. And with that, we'll call it a day. Thank you very much. John gave you the date for the next one. It will be in person and we look forward to seeing everybody then. Have a great day. Have a good day.